So this is the first episode, the first session of early church history. I called it Christianity in the first century. Truth be told, I'm not going to cover the entire first century, just uh, the first 60-ish years of the first century. And then in our next session, we'll cover the second half of the first century. Uh, I'm so thrilled to be here teaching you church history. I love church history. Uh, I'm going to be taking you on an expedition to a different time, a different place where they spoke different languages than English, and to another world uh, where they live without electricity, where they considered literacy to be a specialized skill. It's a very different world from ours. And so I think of myself as a tour guide, someone that is introducing you and giving you a lay of the land to show you what the different events and people and political situations and literature and so on happened and were brought forth in this period. We're looking at the first 500 years of Christianity, give or take, and probably end with the 560s with Justinian, a very famous emperor who did some pretty important stuff. And uh, we're going to start with Jesus and go all the way to Justinian. So from Jesus to Justinian, there you have it, 500 years of Christian history. Um, I have another class where I covered the last 500 years of Christian history. I call it the 500. So this is not to be confused with that. That's uh, covering from the 1500s to today. Uh, this is going to, going to cover the first 500 years. And if I live long enough, uh, maybe I'll cover the middle thousand years some other time. Uh, it's, all, it's all interesting to me. Um, I remember taking church history class about 20 years ago, my first church history class. It was at the Atlanta Bible College. And I remember sitting there as a student thinking to myself, this stuff is so cool. It's so fascinating. It's so weird. There's so many like horrific stories of like really bad things that happen and really inspiring stories of really good things that happen. Why hasn't anyone told me about this? Like, what, why, why don't we know our own history? And uh, I, I, I still hold that to this day. And I hope you experience something along those lines as well, where you get fascinated by this material. To begin with, though, I thought I should cover why you should even care. Why should you care about history? Why does history matter? And so I've got a number of reasons for you to consider. First is to avoid making mistakes of the past. There are so many things that we as Christians in the last 20 centuries have tried and failed at. And we can learn from failure. We can learn from negative examples of ideas that just like didn't work. And uh, you're going to see lots of mistakes that, that people have made. And that's a form of wisdom. A form of wisdom for you to avoid doing something. We also, number two, can become inspired by the heroism of men and women who stood up for their faith, who did great things for God, and who even paid the ultimate sacrifice as martyrs. Number three, we can get guidance and encouragement um, to live in an antagonistic era. Our time today is becoming, it's not nearly as, as antagonistic as it was what we're going to be studying in the first 500 years, but it's, it's moving in that direction, our time today. So looking at people, Christians, who stood strong in the face of persecution, in the face of intolerance, in the face of ridicule, can be really helpful to us as guides today in the kind of culture that many of us are dealing with in the West. Um, I think cr Christian history or church history is really good for tracing doctrinal development. You can figure out what beliefs are truly apostolic, truly go back to the apostles, and which ones were developed later by looking back at the history of Christian thought. Number five, this class will enable you to do your own research. And this is really important to do your own research. You have to know what the thing is called, what the book is titled, what the person is that spoke about this subject. So if you're really into one particular subject, I'm going to constantly tell you primary sources and where to find things so that you can do your own research. Again, I'm a tour guide. I'm not going to give you a full explanation on everything that happened. I'm going to cover Jesus in like five minutes, okay? You want to know more about Jesus? Where do you go? The primary sources. What are the primary sources for Jesus? 
Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Four biographies of Jesus. What, what else could you want? Four biographies? Incredible. Right? So if you want to know more about Jesus, you study those. And so it is with other people. We have biographies, we have letters, we have heresy documents where they're trying to disprove other people, and lots of other uh, histories along the way. And last of all, I want you to be able to see your hidden presuppositions. I want you to be able to see where you are weird. And the only way to see where you are weird, where I am weird, because we're probably both weird in the same way because we live in the 21st century in the West, is to look at a different time period and to see what was normal for them. I have a quote by C.S. Lewis that I thought was just so helpful. He writes in his preface to On the Incarnation, uh, which is a book by Athanasius, uh, C.S. Lewis writes, There is a strange idea abroad that in every subject the ancient books should be read only by the professionals and that the amateur should content himself with the modern books. Thus I have found, as a tutor in English literature, that if the average student wants to find something out about Platonism, the very last thing he thinks of doing is to take a translation of Plato off the library shelf and read the symposium. He would rather read some dreary modern book, ten times as long, all about isms and influences, and only once in twelve pages telling him what Plato actually said. The error is rather an amiable one, for it springs from humility. The student is half afraid to meet one of the great philosophers face to face. He feels himself inadequate and thinks he will not understand him. But if he only knew the great man, just because of his greatness, is much more intelligible than his modern commentator. The simplest student will be able to understand, if not all, yet a very great deal of what Plato said, but hardly anyone can understand some modern books on Platonism. It has always, therefore, been one of my main endeavors as a teacher to persuade the young that first-hand knowledge is not only worth more, only more worth acquiring than second-hand knowledge, but it is usually much easier and more delightful to acquire. This mistaken preference for the modern books and this shyness of the old ones is nowhere more rampant than in theology. Wherever you find a little study circle of Christian laity, you can be almost certain that they are studying not St. Luke or St. Paul or St. Augustine or Thomas Aquinas or Hooker or Butler, but Berdiev or Merichin or Niebuhr or Sayers or even myself. So what C.S. Lewis is saying here is that you should prefer the primary sources. And when it comes to history, primary sources are king. And so as we go along, I'll introduce you to what the primary sources are on this or that. And if, if you, if you uh, believe it or not, most Christian historical books are now, if you don't mind reading old 1800s translations, they're free online. And if you want a nice modern translation that's a critical, based on a critical text and very accurate, they're not that expensive. They're 20 bucks or 15 bucks for most of the, the great uh, Christian literature of the past. Some of it is a little obscure and you have to, you have to pay more for it. But um, this stuff is available. This stuff is within your grasp, either online for free in an older translation or uh, in a library or you can purchase books online. And so a historian who builds an understanding on what previous historians have said rather than on what primary sources say is like someone taking advice from social media on what to invest in rather than reading actual financial reports. Sure, you'll get it right some of the time, but you're also putting yourself at a huge risk of just interpreting everything the way everyone else is interpreting everything, which, when it comes to investing, can be really problematic. So it is with history. You want to read the documents by the people themselves or from that time period itself about those other people so that you can um, understand what's going on. C.S. Lewis continues, Every age has its own outlook. 
It is especially good at seeing certain truths and especially liable to make certain mistakes. We all, therefore, need the books that will correct the characteristic mistakes of our own period. And that means the old books. All contemporary writers share to some extent the contemporary outlook, even those like myself who seem most opposed to it. Nothing strikes me more when I read the controversies of past ages than the fact that both sides were usually assuming without question a good deal which we should now absolutely deny. They thought that they were as completely opposed as two sides could be, but in fact, they were all the time secretly united, united with each other and against earlier and later ages by a great mass of common assumptions. We may be sure that the characteristic blindness of the 20th century, the blindness about which posterity will ask, but how could they have thought that? lies where we have never suspected it and concerns something about which there is untroubled agreement between Hitler and President Roosevelt or between Mr. H.G. Wells and Karl Barth. None of us can fully escape this blindness, but we shall certainly increase it and weaken our guard against it if we read only modern books. Where they are true, they will give us truths which we half know already. And where they are false, they will aggravate the error with which we are already dangerously ill. The only palliative, I love this sentence here, the only palliative is to keep the clean sea breeze of the centuries blowing through our minds. And this can be done only by reading old books. Doesn't this just make you want to read old books? Not, of course, that there is any magic about the past. People were no cleverer then than they are now. They made as many mistakes as we, but not the same mistakes. They will not flatter us in the errors we are already committing. And their own errors, being now open and palpable, will not endanger us. Two heads are better than one, not because either is infallible, but because they are unlikely to go wrong in the same direction. That's a great line right there. Two heads are better than one, not because either is infallible, but because they are unlikely to go wrong in the same direction. To be sure, the books of the future would be just as good a corrective as the books of the past, but unfortunately, we cannot get at them. You are going to see, as we encounter different individuals and events and thought patterns, doctrines, and so on and so forth, you're going to see ways in which you are weird. Because you're going to say, well, that's really weird. But then, you, but then you ask the question, but did all Christians do it that way? Did they all think that way? Maybe it's me that's weird. Or maybe it is them that's weird. And that's for you to decide. That's one of the things I love about history. You get to decide, use your own powers of discernment to figure out what aspects of history you want to incorporate in your life and what aspects you're, you're going to say, you know what, I think they were off base on that. My job is just to tell you what happened. You can disagree with it. You can agree with it. You can, you can think it's crazy. You can think it's normal, whatever. I'm just telling you what happened. We aren't looking at any of these authors as inspired by God or authoritative for all doctrine and practice. These, these are not infallible people. These are just Christians like you and me that lived in a different time period and wrote books that some later Christians copied before they wore out. Because all books wear out in the ancient world, unless somebody copies them every, what, century or so? Depends on where you live and how much it rains, how long the paper is going to last. They're just people, men and women of their own time, who did what made sense to them. All right, so let's talk about dating systems. Uh, in talking with people, this is something that, and in teaching this class, this is something that's come up where there is some confusion. So let's just look at a few dating conventions just to clear up what's what. We have this acronym BC, it means before Christ. And that's equivalent, exactly equivalent, to BCE, which means before common era. And then we have these other two, AD, which stands for the Latin phrase Anno Domini, meaning the year of our Lord, and that's exactly equivalent to CE, which means common era. Now, the old system, as you can see, was based on the most important, in my opinion, 
the most important person in all of human history, Jesus Christ. Because they, they said, all right, everything that happened before Christ, we're going to call B.C., and we're going to count backwards. So 500 B.C. happens before 100 B.C. And then everything after Jesus was born, we're going to count A.D., Anno Domini, the year of our Lord, and we're going to say the year of our Lord, 1. The year of our Lord, 100. The year of our Lord, 1,000. And so 1 is after 100, which is after 1,000. So they, they go in opposite directions, centered on the hinge point of history, which is Jesus Christ. Now, in the early 21st century, public schools and secular universities moved away from B.C. and A.D., and they changed how they date based on C.E. and B.C.E., Common Era and Before the Common Era, because not everyone in the university or in the public school is a Christian. Some people don't believe Jesus is the Christ, namely all Jewish people that aren't Christians, too, don't think Jesus is the Christ. Um, and... Muslim people don't confess Jesus as Lord. Atheists certainly don't. So in order to make a pluralistic system that would work for everyone, they changed it to CE and BCE. You can read all about it on Wikipedia if you want to know more about it. However, me, since I am a Christian, I delight to confess my faith in how I say the date. So I'm going to say BC and AD. And uh, if you're a, a CE, BCE person, you're just translating your own, in your own head. And I just appreciate you giving me the tolerance to confess my faith when I say dates, okay? Um, and I'm happy to extend tolerance to anyone else in their system, whatever they want to use uh, as well. So I still use AD. And besides which, when I was in school... That's how everybody did it. Even the atheists, they said A.D., and there was no big deal, and B.C., and it was no big deal. And so this is a fairly recent development, um, but uh, that's how I'm going to roll with it. Let's talk about the life of Christ. Jesus was born, as it turns out, before Christ. That's hysterical, right? So the guy who calculated the date probably got it wrong by a couple of years. And there's a lot of scholarly debate exactly how many years before Christ. I've seen estimates anywhere from 7 to 2 BC. Uh, I think I did encounter one person that said maybe Jesus was born in AD, like a few years um, AD. Um, I'm not going to really get into dating the birth of, of Christ here with you. I'm sure there's lots of research out there you can look at. Um, and I'm not really able to get much into the life of Christ with you either. However, we have a whole class on just that one person, Jesus Christ. It's called The Historical Jesus. It's on our website, lhim.org. And in that class, I go through uh, his whole life, you know, from his birth to his, to his death and resurrection. And, and I kind of stop it there. I don't cover his ascension and heavenly ministry and theology and stuff like that. Just looking at Jesus in his life. So that's why I call it The Historical Jesus. And you can get that on our website, under classes, and that's on video. And then if you prefer the audio version, I have it on my audio podcast, which is called Restitutio. You can get the audio version there. All right, so who, who is Jesus? Well, to talk about Jesus, we should first talk about John the Baptist. John the Baptist was incredibly successful and popular, and he baptized people with a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus came to John for baptism, and then after that began his ministry. The ministry of Christ involved preaching to many people about the coming kingdom of God, calling people to repentance, and he taught people how to live as citizens of that kingdom or as kingdom centered people. He said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. He healed people. He cast out demons. He uh, brought restoration to outsiders, people that were cast out of the village because of sinful lifestyles. He called them back into relationship and restoration through repentance. And of course, he trained disciples, right? He had the original 12 apostles, and they were all men, but he also had female disciples and other male disciples in addition to the 12 apostles. He had quite a number of people that 
traveled with him from village to village. And Jesus lived with his disciples as a rabbi. It's a very non-Western way of doing it. You know, the way we do school, we, we make sure that the, the student has multiple teachers. And the teacher never goes to the house. Right? If the teacher comes to the house, something's, something's wrong. Right? Um, or if the teacher calls the house, even that is a big deal. Or these days, it's more of like an email than a phone call. Uh, but in the, in, in the Jewish world, to be a rabbi was to live with your students and to show them how to do life. How do we bless our food, Jesus? How, one day they said to him, how do we pray? Just in general, how do we pray? And he said, well, pray like this. And he taught them how to pray. Um, how do we deal with crowds? How do we deal with antagonistic criticisms? How do, do we respond? Do we run away? Do we pick up weapons? Like, how do we deal with, with criticism? And Jesus showed them all about this. The religious experts in Galilee and Judea constantly engaged with Jesus, usually in a critical manner, but sometimes in just kind of a neutral manner. After two or three years, Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. And this marks the huge moment when he comes into Jerusalem with a parade of followers who are proclaiming him to be the Messiah. And it's a huge moment because from the time that you're proclaimed publicly to be the Messiah in Jerusalem, especially during Passover, which there's so many more people in town for that, um, to the time that Jesus was arrested, it was just a few days, right? Just a few days. All happened in, during the same week. By the end of the week, the powerful leaders in Jerusalem arrested Jesus and remanded him to the custody of the Roman governor, Pilate. And after much suffering and torture, the Roman soldiers crucified Jesus on a cross. Three days later, he was raised from the dead. His followers saw appearances of him as a resurrected person. So these, we call these the resurrection appearances. And Jesus left behind an empty tomb. So it wasn't like he was transformed into another kind of being. Like his, his body was gone because it had been resurrected, had been healed, uh, transformed, upgraded, you might say, uh, <laughs> to never die again. So that's pretty sweet. Uh, after 40 days, he ascended into heaven where he sits at the right hand of God until he returns to establish God's kingdom on earth. And that's about all I have time to tell you about Jesus. This is not really a Jesus class. It's a church history class. But like church history is just the story of all the people that followed Jesus for the last 20 centuries. So uh, we want to we wanna mention at least what Jesus did and his incredible impact. From a Roman perspective, though, Jesus was fairly obscure. Uh, there's not much of a mention about him. You do have a little bit in sources outside the Bible. Uh, but he never wrote a book. He never fought a war. He never ran for office. And yet he so taught and inspired his original followers that they then taught and inspired others. And the movement grew and grew so that today in the 20th, 21st century, uh, we now would say that one out of every three people on the planet claims to be a Christian. And the projections for the next 10, 20, and 50 years, the farther out you go with projections, the less reliable they are, just for the record. Um, Christianity is projected to remain one-third of the population as the population continues to grow um, in the future. Maybe not so much in the West, but in the world overall, it is projected to do that. So Jesus is easily the most compelling individual in all of human history, and he's worth your consideration. But we must press on. Initially, there was a lot of skepticism about Jesus from the early church, um, the early followers of Jesus. They were really sad to see him suffer. In fact, they were so scared they didn't even go to his execution. There was nobody singing, Oh, the wonderful cross. <laughs> No, nobody would ever sing that. It was a horrifying moment in their lives to see, or didn't even go, but like to hear about their Lord being crucified, right? Nobody's saying it's wonderful, right? That's all later. Once, once the realization comes of the atonement that Jesus died for their sins, it wasn't just because the Romans didn't like him. Um, and even when he started appearing to them, they didn't believe him. 
He has to convince them. This, this to me is one of the great reasons to believe it's actually true and not made up by some later Christians because they look so bad, right? It's the, the historians call this the criterion of embarrassment. It's the idea that uh, you wouldn't make up a story about yourself that made you look dumb. If you're going to make, your, make a story up about yourself, you'd make yourself look good. Like, oh, yes, Jesus, we always knew you were going to rise from the dead. Nobody says that. They're all like, is that really you? And Jesus is like, do you have any food? Do you have some fish or something? And, and then Thomas wasn't there, and so he doesn't believe, right? And then there's the, the part where he, uh, they go fishing, and Jesus appears to them again. So uh, this, is, this is all the, the rocky beginning of the earliest church. Initially, Christ's followers began organizing, after these resurrection appearances, they began organizing in Jerusalem. They did not go home uh, to Galilee, or maybe they did, but they just did for a visit. But Jerusalem was really the center of early, early, early Christian uh, church history. Persecution, though, uh, pretty quickly came, resulting in a scattering of Christians to Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch. So these are other regions in the Mediterranean world, in the eastern portion of the Mediterranean world. Um, Philip spread the gospel message about Jesus in Samaria. And Peter preached at Lydda, Joppa, and to a certain Italian named Cornelius in Caesarea, uh, an Italian soldier. Now, Antioch, I do want to mention this, Antioch was really a significant place, not necessarily because of its location, but because of what happened there. It was in Antioch that Christianity started mixing, or Jew, Jewish Christianity started mixing with Gentiles. Because Christians were just Jews who believed in Jesus up until that point. Philip preaches to the Samaritans, it's like, whoa, what's going on? Who are these people? Are they, are they really members of the church? And, and the apostles come and they say, yes, they are members of the church. Samaritans are Christians too. And then in Antioch, they start reaching these Gentiles, people from Africa, people from other parts of the Roman world. And they're all meeting together, this diverse community of old and young and different ethnicities and different um, classes where wealthy and poor are sitting together around a table. This is a weird thing in the first century. Nobody's doing that except for the Christians in Antioch. In fact, it's in Antioch that we're first called Christians. That's where we get our, our label, our name, even to this day. And so Barnabas was in Antioch. He's one of the original followers, uh, or I don't know if he was original, but like one of the earliest followers of Christ. And uh, he goes to get Paul, and Paul comes to Antioch. And from Antioch, Paul goes out on his missionary trips. And so Paul goes to Cyprus, which is an island very close to Israel, and then spends a ton of time in what, what we call today Turkey, modern-day Turkey, and uh, does a lot of missionary work, evangelizing, church planting in Turkey, and then in Greece as well. Eventually, uh, Paul gets arrested and... He goes to Crete as a prisoner, and then Sicily, and then Rome. And so Christianity, by the 60s, not 1960s, but the 60s, just 60s, Christianity has spread throughout the Mediterranean world. Jesus, uh, Jesus ministry is, is in the late 20s or early 30s, something like around the year 30 you can think of is the time for his ministry, death, resurrection, ascension, all these things. So it's within 30 years, Christianity has spread to Rome, to Ephesus, major metropolis, uh, to, Thessalonica, to Thessalonica, to uh, the region of Galatia, to Antioch, to Cyprus, to um, Alexandria in Egypt would be very soon after this as well, if not already by that time. So Christianity is spreading all over the Mediterranean world, and you can read all about that in the book of Acts, which leads me to talk about the Greco-Roman world. The Greco-Roman world spoke the Greek language. They did not speak English, and even though the Romans were in charge, 
they mostly didn't speak Latin. Only the governmental functions would happen in Latin, but regular people spoke Greek because the Greeks had conquered the world before the Romans. The Greek gods uh, is what they believed in, though the Romans gave the Greek gods new names. And those are, coincidentally, the names of our planets. So like Mars and Venus and so forth. So forth. Jupiter was uh, Zeus, got renamed to Jupiter and so forth. Um, there were lots of Greek philosophies that held sway throughout this period of the first 500 years of Christianity. But the government was Roman, and the culture was Roman. So instead of calling it Greek or Roman, we, we just use this term Greco-Roman to refer to what the world was like in the beginning periods of Christianity. Spreading ideas was incredibly slow. No internet, no uh, telegrams, no phones, no electricity, no publicly accessible mail system. They did have a mail system, by the way. Uh, it was called the, what was it called? Cursus Publicus, uh, which means the public way. And the Romans had different way stations set on different routes. The Romans were excellent at building roads. The Roman roads, many of them, are still here today. There are the places you could go, and it's like the old Roman road is still there. Um, so, I mean, they were really great at building roads. They said in the ancient world, all roads lead to Rome, right? Because Rome was the center of the government. So if you're going to, going to get troops out to places to conquer them, if you're going to bring money in from places that are already conquered, you need good roads. And uh, one of the other things the Romans did was they vanquished the pirates in the Mediterranean Sea so that merchants could travel through the sea without getting robbed. That was a major issue before the Roman Empire started. So, but only Romans could use, only the Roman government could use their mail system. So Christians had to send letters. Uh, you had to like hire your own mailman, basically, and say, hey, I need you to deliver this to this other city, or find some friend or relative that was already going and give it to that person. And then when that person arrived, nobody can read. So that person would need to read it out loud to whoever it was. I mean, not nobody, but a very low percentage could read. So it's not just carrying the letter, but it's also reading the letter. In the early period of the first half of the first century, we also have persecution. And of course, Jesus is the first one to be persecuted by the Roman government. And he was crucified by the Sadducean leaders and the Roman governor. The Sadducees were the sect of Jews who were in charge of the temple. And Jesus, as you recall, uh, rode into the temple area, uh, proclaimed as Messiah, and then knocked over all the tables and messed with the temple. Yeah, that'll get the Sadducees' attention. So they, uh, they eventually uh, had him arrested and turned him over to the Romans who crucified Jesus. That was in the 30s. Stephen was stoned in the 30s by Jews prior to Paul's conversion. In the 40s, James was killed by Herod Agrippa. Uh, the Roman appointed king. In the 60s, we had um, Peter, Paul, and James, the brother of Jesus, all uh, executed for their faith, all martyred for their faith. And this happened during Nero's reign. Nero's full name, because he's a Roman, he has four, no, five names. Um, Nero, Claudius, Caesar, Augustus, Germanicus, we just call him Nero. He reigned from 54 to 68 as the emperor. He became the emperor at 16 years old. I don't know if you know any 16-year-olds. I live with a 16-year-old. It's quite a thought to have a 16-year-old emperor. <laughs> to have absolute power at that age. He, he ruled for a little while. He was ambitious. Uh, he was also a little crazy. Reportedly, he murdered his own mother had her killed. Um, and there's lots of other stories about Nero and his excesses. You can read about from the Roman historians. Okay. Um, however, what I want to focus on is what happened on July 19th in the year 64 AD. A huge fire broke out in Rome. And this fire started in the shops near the massive chariot stadium. They had a stadium in Rome that could seat 150,000 people. Most of our football stadiums, maybe all of our football stadiums can't do that. I don't know if we have 
ones that are that big. But uh, 150,000 people, and the fire started in the shops right by the, the big stadium. And the hot summer wind spread the fire, which burned for six days, especially in the slums of the two million person city of Rome. After the fire came under control, it reignited and burned for another three days until 10 of the 14 districts of the city were destroyed. Basically, two-thirds of the city of Rome got burned in the year 64. Um, people accused Nero, the emperor, of starting the fire because he wanted to rebuild the city and to establish some changes in the public buildings. So they were blaming him, and so he needed a scapegoat. He needed someone to blame for the fire, and he needed a group that was going to be vulnerable or an individual that was vulnerable that people would um, agree was to blame. So here comes the primary source. Are you ready for it? Tacitus. Tacitus was a Roman historian. He wrote a book called The Annals, and he said the following. All, and he's uh, from the same period of time, all human efforts, all the lavish gifts of the emperor and the propitiation of the gods did not banish the sinister belief that the conflagration, that's the fire, was the result of an order. That's the idea that Nero commanded the fire to start. Consequently, to get rid of the report, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilatus, and, most, and a most mischievous superstition thus checked for the moment again broke out not only in Judea, the first source of the evil, but even in Rome, where all things hideous and shameful from every part of the world find their center and become popular. Accordingly, an arrest was first made of all who pleaded guilty. Then upon their information, an immense multitude was convicted, not so much of the crime of firing the city as of hatred against mankind. This is persecution. Mockery of every sort was added to their deaths. Covered with the skins of beasts, they were torn by dogs and perished or were nailed to crosses or were doomed to the flames and burnt to serve as nightly illumination when daylight had expired. Nero offered his gardens for the spectacle and was exhibiting a show in the circus while he mingled with the people in the dress of a charioteer or stood aloft on a car. Hence, even for criminals who deserved extreme and exemplary punishment, there arose a feeling of compassion, for it was not as it seemed for the public good, but to glut one man's cruelty that they were being destroyed. I believe that this is when both Peter and Paul uh, died. We have good evidence, good historical evidence, that they died in Rome in the 60s. Uh, it makes sense to fit that as a result of this huge roundup of all the Christians they could find, if they're leaders in the movement, of course, when investigations occur, you want to find the leaders and arrest the leaders. And so this is likely when they were killed as well. It's hard to say for sure that Nero had them killed um, or even knew who they were, but it just fits historically that this, this would be when it happened. Either it happened then or shortly thereafter. Um, when I read these words, when I read what Tacitus says about our earliest ancestors, the first generation of Christians after Christ, okay, um, I think to myself two things. One, it's not that bad. Today, it's not, it's not that bad. I mean, if they're not rounding us up, sewing us in bear skins and setting wild dogs on us to tear us to pieces to the to the delight of the crowds who hate our guts so much that they're cheering while innocent people are being murdered, it's not that bad. It's not that bad. If they're not fixing us to crosses or burning us at night to illuminate the gardens of the psychopathic emperor, it's not that bad. And two, we're still here. We made it through stuff like this. We made it through the, the consequences of the fire of Rome in 64. And our people, guess what? We continued to preach the gospel in Rome. 
We continue to share the gospel in other parts of the Mediterranean world. This did not stop us in the past. I think that's incredibly inspiring to face this kind of persecution where you're rounded up and murdered to the mob's delight and say, you know what? I'm going to keep following Jesus anyhow. Where else am I going to go? So I find that incredibly inspiring. We're still here. All right, let's review. I started by making a case that church history matters. It matters because you want to avoid mistakes. You want to be inspired by heroic examples. You want to find out what your own presuppositions are. You want to discover what truths really go back to the earliest times and which ones were developed later. We also talked about how primary sources are king. And I read to you that quote by C.S. Lewis that said, old books are cool. That was basically, it's a lot of words to get that across, but like old books are really cool. You should read them. And then we talked about dating systems. B.C. and B.C.E. are the same. A.D. and C.E. are the same. We looked at the life of Christ, the growth of the early church, the Greco-Roman world, a world equally influenced by Greek and Romans. Um, and then we looked at a little bit of persecution in the first half of the first century. All right, so that's it for this one. Next time we're going to cover the Jewish war with Rome and learn about Jewish Christianity in the first century as we continue our quest to understand early church history.